let's all stand together. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies. Welcome to ladies session, first day of convention 2023. Woo Discovering God. Amen. Let's just bow our heads quickly for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord. We thank you that you brought us into this place, Lord. We thank you for this amazing ministry, Lord, GGWO Convention, Lord. Thank you that you brought us all here safely, Lord. And we just pray that you anoint this session, touch our hearts, touch every heart. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Who's ready? Sing. So great to worship the Lord together. We stand and lift up. the Lord. Just lift him up today all together and just 
think about his goodness, goodness and all he's brought us through, everything that brought you here into this place until now. Thanking him, worshiping. Good morning, daughters of the King. So good to see you. Has it been a year already since we've been together? Ah, oh, look out, I see sisters, mothers. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Daughters, friends, I don't have any daughters. I just pick my own out here in the body. Who wants to come to lunch with me? 
Come on, we'll have fun. We'll buy shoes. I just pushed myself into people's lives. How about you? Hey, I need friends. I've been thinking about Psalm 100. Psalm 100, verse 1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. It's a little children's song I've sang for many years. But that word joyful noise is a battle cry. It could be before the battle, when we get our swords out. It could be after the battle, when we see the banner over us is love. But it's a battle cry. How many of you had a battle this year? Only one? <laughs> Two? Twelve? Twelve? One, one a month, you had battle of the week? Yeah, okay. Our first speaker has written this book, Find His Rest, O oh My Soul, Sandrine Knowles. She has no idea, but she sat with me through this book day after day after day of a battle that I fought. I'll tell you about it at the end of the session. Let me just read one thing she said to me. All those feelings of guilt and inadequacy do not have to plague us anymore. Do you hear that, devil? <sighs> Sandrine, you have no idea. All those feelings of guilt and inadequacy do not have to plague us anymore. We have the authority of Calvary to deny them access into our hearts. We do not have to be paralyzed by judgment or condemnation. The penalty for sin has been paid in full once and for all. I am free. I can rest in the finished work of Christ for me. Hallelujah. Please welcome Sandrine Knowles. <laughs> Love you. So much. Good morning, all you brave lady coming in early in the morning. Well, I'm still using a chair, but I don't have my hat today, so there's improvement <laughs> in my health. But um, <clears throat> Michelle asked me to share um, what happened with my son uh, last summer and uh, what God did through all of that. And um, in that context of discovering God, I was thinking, I was meditating on this, like, what is my view of God? And is it accurate? What do I think that God is like? What is my image of God? And uh, A.W. Tozer said in one of his books, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What do I think of God? Who is he like? What was he like in the trial with Josh? And... Um, a year ago, uh, Michelle asked me to share here in fear and trembling because my health was still quite, quite a struggle. And uh, it was about taking courage. And I remember sharing about weakness and hope. And I had no idea. <laughs> Two weeks later, uh, we were going to undergo a major trial uh, in our family. But let me read you one verse as an introduction. It's in... Isaiah 57, verse 15, 18, and 19. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and the heart of the contrite ones. And verse 18, I have seen his ways and I will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. So um, Joshua, we adopted Joshua when we were missionary in Malaysia on the island of Borneo. And uh, he was born with a malrotation of a bowel, and he had a life-saving surgery when he was two weeks old. And he spent the first 18 months of his life in a hospital. And uh, we were visiting him every day until we could adopt him when he was 18 months old. And I was always told that he was a child at risk of, um, of a major you know, obstruction that could be quite severe because of his condition. 
But, you know, he's 14 years old now and he was 13 last year and nothing bad had happened and you kind of like get familiar <laughs> with the possibility until um, last July um, we had to rush him to the emergency through an ambulance because he was in, in screaming pain, I mean screaming pain. And, um, and we knew this is serious. So he was um, sent to Franklin Square. They took some CAT scan and they got scared. And they transferred him immediately to John Hopkins surger surgery, um, surgical ward. And after they did all the scan, they said, we have to do an immediate um, <clears throat> emergency surgery. He was put first. Um, he was boosted up to the first of the line for surgery. So he went into surgery for six hours. And <clears throat> as a mom, uh, you know this child is a gift. He was my promised child. That's quite an amazing story, his adoption as well. But um, I had to give him over, as us moms, we do over and over again all through our life. We give our children to God. But that was like, I really had to give him to God <laughs> because I, otherwise there was no peace unless you surrender. And unless you take control out of your hand, you cannot have peace. So I had to give him over to God during the surgery, and I thought, okay, now it's going to be all good. But um, upon awaking, it wasn't good. There was um, the medication was not quite right that was given to him, so he woke up in agonizing pain, <clears throat> and he lasted for four hours, screaming. In the, in the hospital, the whole world could hear him literally screaming for four hours of pain. And the, the nurses didn't know what to do. They said, we never seen anything like it. Uh, they would change his medicine. They were limited about the amount they could give him. And uh, my husband was on the phone with all the different pastors. Everybody was praying. And, um, and I should have been such a mess, especially, you know, with my health and everything that there's no way I could have handled to see your child screaming and you're in the hospital and nobody can help him. And I had the most unbelievable peace come upon me. And that wasn't because I had great faith, because I didn't. It, I was so weak. It was completely a gift of grace. Just this, um, the stronger peace, strongest peace I have ever experienced in my life uh, just came upon me during these four hours that he was in agony. I just couldn't explain it. I was, I was, I was still, I was peaceful. And uh, finally, he got stabilized, thank God, and we thought, okay, it's going to get better now. And, uh, you know, they told us in one week or so, he should be out of the hospital. But it didn't get better. It got, it got complicated. Um, the bowel that was uh, in his stomach just kept coming back up. And there was some kind of inflammation that stopped it going down. So he had to be tubed up in six different places. And he couldn't eat or drink. And that lasted six weeks. No food, no drink. Um, he was fed through a peak line. And that was, they, again, they had never seen that happen before. Uh, you know, they said, it can happen two weeks maximum, and he, if it continues, there's, there's a problem. So we, uh, they put him on all kinds of medicine. One lowered his heart rate dangerously. Then he got hugely dehydrated for days. So he was, his life was, you know, like in the balance several times. And again, going back to surrender. Uh, the only way that I could make it emotionally was through surrendering him to God over and over again. Um, so during, at the beginning, maybe one week while he was in hospital, God gave me Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, which says, Do not be afraid, stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. The Egyptian you see today, you will see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And he gave it to me in my daily devotional. Then the same day, Mary Laflame contacted me, sent me a message from Pastor Schaller. And he was on that verse, Stand Still, Exodus 14. On the same day, we 
um, the nurse told us, make him walk. So we made him walk with all his tubes and <laughs> uh, to a statue of Jesus in John Hopkins. And we were praying there. And we saw books open. People had written things down. And it was a page right in the middle. On the same day, we go over what is there, but that verse. And then a nurse says, oh, I heard on the shiny fame about the importance of standing still. And I thought about you guys, like, I, I don't know why. I just kept thinking about you guys. So four times God gave us that message. And we needed that. It was supernatural. And I thought the deliverance was going to be today. Because it said today in the verse. But the deliverance came five weeks later. <laughs> so for five weeks, it was like really hard. Uh, I, I won't say that it was easy. It was really, really hard um, to keep believing. Like I had to really, and I'll share that at the end, but I, I had to really keep a, a watch on my heart and, and what I would allow my thoughts to be. Uh, you know, despair could come in, discouragement, and where, God, you told me this, why weren't you doing anything? So during those five weeks, we were waiting for, to see if it would be resolved. Uh, the surgeon said we might have to do a second surgery, but it's risky because it's so soon after, and it, it was a big surgery that he had. They said we have to wait, we have to wait. And um, so during those five weeks, Josh went through everything from discouragement to joy. Uh, you know, he's amazing. He really walks with God, and he would, you know, have amazing moments with God. And, and uh, many visitors, the body was amazing. He was the most visited child ever <laughs> from our church. Everybody visited us, and, uh, and that meant so much to him. Tommy Janowski would come and watch movie with him in the evening so we could come to church. And uh, I mean, I really saw the body in action in a way that was, it was like the whole church was with us, giving rides, giving meals, a prayer. And what I learned as well during that time is never hesitate to encourage someone who's going through something. Like sometimes we think, well, I'm praying for that person. I don't need to talk to that person. But every single word, people I didn't even know, every word that somebody would come and say, we're praying, or we believe in God, or I would get texts from people, or messengers, or people I didn't know so well. Every single word gave me strength. Every single one, and thank you. <laughs> so I really learned that, like, wow, I don't want to hesitate again. Just like in marriage, you think it, say it. You think your husband is great, tell him. You know, like you're having this thought, say it. If it's edifying, of course. Uh, <laughs> think it, say it. Um, that's my motto. Um, so the body was amazing. And then a week before, the, the surgeon had said, okay, we're going to have to operate again. It's risky, but we don't have a choice. This, this child's got to eat again one day. <laughs> so, you know, he was all tubed up. we got to do something. And a week before the surgery was due, he had been already many weeks in hospital, I felt that God was telling me, surrender the promise that I gave you, which was, you know, I will deliver him. And I was so sure of it that God was going to do a miracle. So I had to surrender the promise. And I, I really felt he was like Abraham walking up a mountain, uh, and he had a promise for his son, and he had to give him, give him, give him away. And uh, knowing that God was somehow going to do it. So I surrendered the promise. And I, I had no peace about the surgery whatsoever because it went so bad, the first one. But I felt like, okay, if it's surgery, it's surgery. If you don't heal him, you don't heal him. Not my will, but yours be done. Well, I really think you will. The day that I did that, the bowel going back up, which was going back up through tubes through his nose started to go down on the day that I surrendered the promise. And it was a week before surgery, and every day it would go down, it would, there would be less and less amount. So I told the surgeon, look, can we wait or can we cancel the surgery? And he was like, no, no, we're still having surgery, there's still things going back up, he still has an obstruction, we got to operate. And he knew, but like we kept telling him that the whole church was praying, say thousands of people are praying. Camp Life, all the kids were praying. People all around the world, 
Pastor Love asked for a fast. People were fasting for days for Joshua, for a miracle. And, um, and so we told the surgeon that we're expecting a miracle. And he thought, of course, we were crazy. And, and the nurses, sometimes we would grab nurses and say, pray with us for a miracle. And some nurses prayed, even unbelievers, like God was really working in the hospital. And two days before the surgery was due, I was so convinced he wasn't going to have a surgery, which seemed crazy. It seemed impossible. And by faith, we asked the surgeon, can we do one more upper GI where they put a liquid through and they see if he goes through if there's still a blockage or not? And he was like, why? He's still having surgery. I said, what, what if it all goes through? He said, well, if magically it goes through, we'll cancel the surgery, but it's not going to happen. So the day before surgery, they do the upper GI, and Josh said at that time, he suddenly felt so well. And Sarah and I, my daughter, we were listening to a song, Turn It Around, which Sidonie sent us over and over again. We kept playing the song, praising God, saying, God, you do it now, you do it now. We were crying, we were praising, we were believing God. And then the physician came and took x-rays, and he said, oh, it's all gone through. I'm like, What? So he contacts the surgeon. The surgeon doesn't believe it. And he says, no, it's impossible. Just keep doing x-ray all through the day. The evening comes. The surgeon comes into the room. And he said, we had to cancel the surgery. Everything's gone through. 12 hours before the surgery was due. So a week later, Josh was finally dismissed from hospital after seven weeks and eating pizza, <laughs> which was his dream. So just quickly... Uh, for a couple minutes, what I had to really watch out was my heart, my thought life, the inner language that I was speaking to myself. In any trials we go through, what is my inner language? Is it despair? Is it doubt? Am I feeding myself um, the worst possible outcome in the situation? Or is it faith? Is it hope? Going against my natural inclination? that God's going to do this, you know, speaking words of life to myself because I'm so weak and I need it. And I had to, I'm not kidding, I had to listen to three or four messages every single day <laughs> to make it emotionally because I didn't have it in me. I was like, my faith is so small. The only way I can increase my faith is by hearing the word. That's the only way. And I would hear the word continually from the moment I would wake up to the moment I couldn't sleep unless I heard one or two messages before sleeping. And the word going in, submerging my soul, is what kept me emotionally. And also writing by faith was devotional. I, I, I didn't know what I was writing, but I was just saying it by faith. Like I had to confess uh, the goodness of God despite sight. And um, Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So this is how important our thought life is and what language, what do we say to ourselves during those times. And what I found yet again is that God is reliable, God is strong, God is faithful, God is gracious, God is good, God is big. We can really trust him. God is comfort. God is healer. God is my father. And the last verse I want to read in Revelation 19.11. <clears throat> now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And that's who God is. Amen. Her book is available at Blessing Boutique. You know the clothes I wear, Blessing Boutique. It's my $3 outfit. They've put us in the wonderful Pizza Hut at the end, Pizza Hut, Youth Hut, Kid Hut, whatever. It's now the Blessing Hut. So at the end of the plaza, you come out of the chapel, turn left. And we have another book there. And as it so happens, one of the authors of our book is your next speaker. Susan Silva wrote for us in our book, To Everything There Is a Season, she chose a time to kill. 
Doing away with natural thinking involves a daily discipline of putting on the mind of Christ. She wrote, the devil constantly lies to us and projects images of failure, shame, and guilt. He argues that God cannot love us, use us, or forgive us. When we embrace his lies, we find ourselves trapped in his fortress for as long as we believe the lie. It's time to shut the door on him and return back to God in humility. Take back what the word says is ours and experience healing and deliverance from oppression, depression, and condemnation. Pull down the strongholds that have held us hostage. Please welcome Susan Silva. Love you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We worship you. Lord, you, we give you all the glory and the praise for all you've done in our lives and speak to us together, speak to us and minister to each one sitting here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love the theme of the conference, discovering God. I love her. I love it. And the word discover, I was thinking about it. It means to obtain knowledge of something for the first time. To find out something I didn't know before. And, um, you know, we spend time with one another um, during convention. We get to know people. But when you really sit down with them and talk to them and get to know them and visit them and live in their homes, you just get to know how amazing they are. And I had the privilege this year of visiting our friends in France the church is in France in, in March, and I've known about them. We've, my husband and I have prayed for them for years, but I stayed with my friends, and my, they, I, I discovered how amazing they are. And so many of them are sitting here, and I just love you so much. And that's our Christian life is a journey of discovering God. It's a lifetime journey. You never get to know God fully. You will know him. You will see him. When you see him, you really, in heaven, we'll get to know. We'll still be learning about him, you know. And, oh, there are many Indians here from Mumbai and Bangalore. And if you're here, just raise your hands quickly. Yeah, okay, just get to know them. They are amazing women as well, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, my journey, um, you know, began when I was 13, and I see some young people here today. And I went to a crusade and I got saved. And I, my, I began to realize that God is very real. And that I can have a relationship with him. And that he's a good God. And that he has a plan for my life. And that he was going to teach me how to discover this plan and how to fulfill it. And I look at my life in the last 30, 40 years and I'm still discovering him. And how do we discover God today? How do we find out who he is? We discover him in the scriptures. I read it and I'm like, oh, God, this is who you are to me. You're just not God, but this becomes like, like my confession changes. So you are my God. You are my God. You know, so there are a couple of things that I want to talk about what I have discovered in my journey. And um, Jeremiah 29, 13 God speaks to Jeremiah and tells him, um, this is what you're going to tell the exiles when they come out of captivity. Um, and you shall seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And that word find is discover. Matzah in the, in the Hebrew, it discover. You're going to find out things that you never knew about me before. And um, the same thing, the same word is found in Matthew 7, 7 and many other places. Seek and you shall find. And our journey to discovering God begins with seeking him. We need to have a heart that wants to know him because he wants to reveal himself to you in your present situation, reveal an aspect of his character to you. Today, at this moment, right now, he wants to show him his goodness to you, right? So Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things you do not know. How do we discover God? We discover him in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit teaches us about God in John 14. We can also find God in the details of our life. Every day, 
you know, in the mundane and the extraordinary. He takes the simple, I mean, our everyday things we go through and he, and he just reveals an aspect of his nature to us. And then we discover him in the body. I discover him like through your lives, you know, his goodness I receive from you. And you bear the image of the heaven. You bear the image of Christ. And this is how we discover God. And there are things in my life, and many things I've discovered about God, but a few things I'd like to talk about. One is mercy. I, deserve, I, I have discovered God's mercy in my failures. Many, 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 many times I have failed God. And I have discovered that mercy rejoices against chat, over judgment in James 2.13. And you know what else I discovered in, in Proverbs 11, um, 17? The, the merciful man does good for his own soul. And he who is cruel troubles his own flesh. And that's amazing. And I've asked God to teach me and to make me a merciful person so that, you know, we don't want our flesh, our bodies, our families to be troubled, right? So a merciful man does good to his own soul. Next, I have discovered the value of seeking God's wisdom above my own. Yep, God knows it better than I do. I've discovered um, that God knows everything about me. <laughs> I don't need to hide anything. I don't need to be afraid. I can come to him in my frailty, in my weaknesses. I don't have to have any hidden, closet, any, any hidden drawers in my closet. I can just have the Holy Spirit, like, invite him, open it to help me, God. You know, he knows, Psalm 139 tells us that he knows everything about my life. Nothing surprises him. And he loves me the way I am. And I've discovered his faithfulness when I have struggled and doubted and struggled to believe he has been faithful. Second Timothy 2.13. I have discovered that God's timing is perfect. Sometimes we don't always think that. We wait and you wait and you wait and you wait. But I have discovered that he makes all things beautiful in his time. In Ecclesiastes 3.11. You know, God has put the same verses that God has put eternity in our hearts. And, um, you know, and um, this is what it means. It means that there is a sense in all of us that we are made, there is much more than all this world has to offer us. And, um, you know, there's much more than what you see. There's much more than what you're going through. What's much more than what you've been through. And God has given us a living hope. He has put eternity in our hearts. And lastly, I've discovered that God fights our battles. I love the Psalm 100, uh, 100, that like shout to the Lord, like we have a battle cry. And I, really, the battle is won. The war has been won, but the enemy wants us to wage war on this level, but really it's won. And God has given us a position in him so that we can have his mind and fight the battles with the mind of Christ. You know, and, um, and battles, because we are spiritual beings, we are body, soul, and spirit, our battles, our conflicts are spiritual in nature, and therefore they call, uh, it calls for having a m spiritual mindset, because a l the mind that is set on the spirit is life and peace. Like we all will go through battles, and Paul says in Ephesians um, um, six, that we are to put on the whole armor of God so that we can withstand the wiles of the enemy. And the, I love the word withstand. It means like you hold your ground. You hold your ground. You don't give up. You don't let the enemy push you around. You say, no, you're not having my mind. You say, no, you can't have this. And, you know, and when you have done everything in, you know, in, in the evil days, you would stand. I'm just paraphrasing all this because of the lack of time, but we all have an evil day. We all had an evil day. And what do you do when you have an evil day? God wants us to just put on his mind, put on our armor, and stand. You know, there's a spiritual posture God wants us to have, and that's rest, and that you stand. You stand and you declare your personal convictions. You declare all that you know about God. And, um, you know, uh, King Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 20 12 had an evil day, and you can read it. It's a, I don't have the time to explain it to you, but when everything was going on well in his life, one day he heard that there was an army coming against him. Three 
armies all together at the same time. It was his evil day, and he went, he, he prayed, and he fasted, like Sandrine said, he, he sought God, he sought God, and he said, Lord, I am helpless, we are helpless against this multitude in verse 20. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And that has been my prayer many, 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 many times over 30 years. I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. I don't even have a plan. Have you been there? But my eyes are upon you. And that's what God wants us to have in the battle. He wants us to have our eyes upon him. And he, and he wants us to position ourselves, to put ourselves in a place where we experience his victory. You know, what did Jehoshaphat do? He bowed down. He worshipped. He, um, he appointed those in verse 21 of Second Chronicles 20. He appointed those who would sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. And they went before the army saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. We can discover God's power and presence in the battle. We can sing songs of praise. And I have been through it. You know, we can have joy in the battle. And, you know, if you, some, most of you know that we went through a battle for eight years where my husband was afflicted. And um, when we got the doctor's report, um, it seemed like we were in a pit. Have you felt like that ever? Like, oh my gosh, what is happening in my life? I'm overwhelmed. God, I don't know what to do. We don't have a plan, but our eyes are upon you. And that's what happened. And we, and we decided that we're going to have joy. This, the name of God is in our house. We're going to have joy in this house. And I don't care what the enemy says. We're all going to leave earlier than someone else. But why not have joy serving God? Why not? And you can do things when you have, like Sandrine says, you have eyes that are looking at Jesus and you have a walk of faith and you have praise in your lips and you have the word in your heart and you discover God's power and you discover his strength in the battle. And you say the battle belongs to the Lord and God has said, like Sandrine said, stand still and see the salvation of God. We cannot, we cannot, I have a minute, we cannot stand, we cannot see the salvation if we are restless. We cannot have an expectation if you're fretting, because fretting only leads to evil doing. So um, I have many stories I could share with you, but I want to say that the battle is the Lord's. Watch what battle you're picking up to fight. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, and the enemy would like to make it flesh and blood. Oh, it's your child, oh, it's that person in the church, oh, it's the pastor, oh, it's this one. But it's not. It's demons that want your peace of mind. They want your Focus off of Christ. That's all they want. Jesus calls the devil a thief in John 10.10. 10. He doesn't come by the gate. He comes by the back door. But we enter Jesus, the gate. Jesus enters by the gate. And we enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and with songs of praise. And the Message Bible says the password to entering God's gates is thank you. Amen. Right. If you want to take these two ladies home with you after convention, unfortunately you cannot, but you can come to Blessing Boutique and get their books and let them sit with you during the winter like I did. Um, let me. I've just got two more minutes and I'm going to close. I just want to tell you, I went through an interesting trial this fall. In October, God sent a hurricane to southern Florida and destroyed my mother-in-law's house. Completely, completely, everything, her car, everything. She had nothing but two suitcases full of clothes that happened to be up on a top shelf. The next day, the next day, her live-in boyfriend of 33 years, don't talk to me about that. <laughs> she was unsaved, so what do you expect? Her live-in boyfriend broke up with her. Okay. Okay. The next week, she found out she was having her fourth cancer, 83 years old. No house, no boyfriend, no car, cancer, and she's got a month of radiation. She had to Uber to these daily radiation appointments, and then she started to fall. And the nephew she was living with called us up and said, well, you guys have to move to Florida to take care of her. And I said, we, we will pray about that. How about if you convince her to move to be with us? Now, an unsaved 83-year-old woman who 
only watches Wheel of Fortune and doesn't like me. She came. We flew to Florida on December 10th and picked her up because God had showed me in a verse, 2 Samuel 15, 15, David is fleeing Jerusalem and his servants say, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my Lord the King shall appoint. What was I going to say to God? If the servants of David were willing to do whatever, was Michelle Benoit going to say no to God? We said yes, because it was our assignment. And I already knew before we picked her up, at the end of this assignment, whenever the end was, I was praying for her to be healed and live with us for 10 years and get saved and enjoy the body. I'll tell you tomorrow whether or not that happened. But I wanted to hear, well done, good and faithful daughter-in-law. Thank you for coming. Blessing Boutique is open at noon and then again at 4.30 and then tonight after the evening service. Come visit us there. Have a wonderful day, ladies.